Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining the National Organization for Women and the Feminist Majority Foundation as we come together in our feminist state of the union. As folks continue to join us tonight, we invite you to let us know in the chat box where you're joining us from. Now, we hope that you all enjoy our programming as we balance our time together. And with that, I would love to introduce our two co-hosts for this evening, now National President Christian Nunez and Feminist Majority Foundation President Ellie Smeal. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I am Christian Nunez, and I'm the president of the National Organization for Women. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Feminist State of the Union event, where we look at issues that are happening in America through the feminist lens. I am so honored to introduce my co-host for the evening, the infamous, the wonderful co-founder and president of the Feminist Majority, Eleanor Smill. Thank you, Christian. I'm really excited to be here too. And I think we'll, and I'm so happy so many have joined us today. And I'm very thrilled at our speakers. So it should be a, not only a good day, but we're gonna take a critical feminist look at where we are today. Yes, this is gonna be an exciting conversation. So if you have your coffee, your tea, whatever you need to get your drinks, as we can indulge into this deep conversation, do it now. Um, we welcome all of you. Thank you all for supporting and joining this event. Um, our speakers tonight will weigh in on the seismic cultural and economic challenges women in the United States have faced over the last year. And our, con our continued pandemic, we know, inflation rates, instability overseas, and continued attacks on democracy, reproductive rights, and voting rights are fundamental rights that have tested our values and have threatened to unravel the very fabric of what we identify as our society. But there are, were way more um, moments of joy that we also want to highlight and and lift up tonight as we inspire to keep dreaming and keep fighting to keep us encouraged as we battle on in this 2022 year we can look at some amazing facts and things that can think about we can think about the fact that for the first time ever we witnessed women kicking down doors shattering ceilings and moving the needle forward for all of us the first time ever at president biden's state of the union we witnessed two women standing behind him in the side, or his side, I would like to really say. The first woman of color, Vice President, Vice President Kamala Harris, and the first woman speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. They were sitting in important roles. So lets us know the accomplishments that we can make and the places that we can go. And we also saw the nomination of our first Black woman Supreme Court Justice, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. And we celebrated Deb Holland becoming the first Native American woman to head the Department of Interior. We cheered on Ngozi Konjo Iwali, a Nigerian economist who became the first woman and first African to lead the World Trade Organization. And in October, Dr. Rachel Levine became the first female and openly the first openly transgender four-star officer in the US Public Health Service Commission's Corp. So we can just see how many wonderful things women have been doing and making progress. And we also saw an amazing success when the U.S. women's national soccer team finally settled their lawsuit for equal pay lawsuit, and the team received $24 million in agreement from the Soccer Federation to equalize their pay with the men's and women's national teams. That alone is a major victory, and it keeps us encouraged we have to go forward. Now, across we see in abroad, we've seen some devastating things happen. Um, like the war in Ukraine, but we have seen women, Ukrainian women take stands up to defend their country and Afghanistan feminist activists showing their strength and resolve and fighting against reinstated Taliban restrictions. So across this world, we've seen major challenges happen where women, women have showed that we will continue to persist and resist. And in health and science, women researchers paved the way with in, involving and in discovering the COVID treatment and preventions including Anika Chavrola, a 14-year-old from Frisco, Texas, whose research could prove potential therapy for COVID-19. Can you imagine a 14-year-old having therapies for COVID-19? Um, and with young women and girls who are making a difference in every field. Gen Z climate activists are paving the way for a brighter future for all us and letting us know the intersection between racial justice and climate justice. They're speaking up at the COP26 conference against the worsening global climate changes we're seeing. 
And in the business world, women are continuing to grow in leadership positions in Fortune 500 magazine and companies have demonstrated these challenges and these, um, these advances women have made, as well as on Wall Street. And even at the individual level, women are making strides from many things and different outlets in different positions. So we wanna make sure we acknowledge the different spectrums women are successful in, and different ways they take leadership in. It's not always in the C-suite, but they still are leaders in making changes. And in the entertainment world, we saw Chloe Zhao make the history becoming the first um, woman of color, the first Asian descent woman to earn the best director in Academy Awards this year the Oscars. So it's been so many amazing challenges that we've overcome, still things we have to overcome, but so many wonderful successes and highlights we can look at too. And it's so important that we celebrate all these successes, that we continue to uplift each other and continue to uplift women who are breaking barriers for us and that they leave, so it becomes more normalized in our society where we see women can do and accomplish anything. And as often as we can, we must shine a light on a woman succeeding in leadership positions, especially BIPOC women, and so that young girls and boys can see and understand that women are equal, that women are valuable, and women are successful to the success of our nation and our world. Well, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but now it's my turn to, to give you a little humbug. <laughs> and uh, yes, we've been making a lot of project, Progress, pro, progress, but we have a long, long way to go. And this has been a particularly um, difficult year. Um, we applauded a lot of what President Biden said in his State of the Union message and his perseverance to fight for child care and for um, human services care, for the elderly care, uh, for paid family medical leave, but we didn't get them. And we still haven't gotten them. And I uh, have, I think the last, the earliest I started speaking on this subject was in the 70s and 80s, fighting for paid family medical leave, and we're still not there. It's still only on paid. Um, but there has, as you said, been a lot of gains. And one that I hadn't realized is that of the, of the judges that Biden has appointed to the court, 75% are women. That's the most, uh, the highest percentage of all the presidents. And, and he has not only appointed more judges in the first year than any other, other president, but more of them, 75% of them have been women. And we needed that because we're still very underrepresented in the courts. Um, the, the toughest thing that's happened, of course, is uh, the pandemic, which uh, took a lot out of uh, women out of the workforce. And many of them have not been able to rejoin. Although men have rejoined, many, many women have not because of the lack of childcare and the lack of el elderly care. Um, and when you talk about Afghanistan, as you probably know, we have a large um, program on helping and supporting Afghan women. It's just been ghastly what's happened since the Taliban has taken over. It's hard to and it makes me so sad and mad at the same time that uh, they promised that girls would be able to go to school, but then they reneged on that promise and no, no, they only can go to school first through sixth grade, Senior, junior high school, high school, college, and the public schools are still closed. Um, women can't travel unless they have very far without the companion, uh, without having a male chaperone from their own family. It goes on. Uh, women have been pushed out of the uh, labor market totally, um, for the most part, uh, saying that it's safer if they don't go to work. It, it goes on. It's, it's misogyny, clear and simple. But we still have a lot of problems here. As you know, we just celebrated um, Equal Pay Day, but it's, it's not equal, and it's even worse for women of color, for the disabled, for um, any of the marginalized communities. So we have a long way to go there, and we still have to pay uh, to pass major legislation that would make it possible. And of course, we have to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, and I'll get to that later. Um, but right now, we have to not only fight for the Equal Rights Amendment, help and support 
uh, women abroad, especially Afghan women and women in Ukraine. But then we have um, this terrible right-wing tack on abortion rights. Uh, it's just unbelievable that they're passing these six weeks bans, which are nothing more than outlawing. Uh, it. And so far the Supreme Court has not been helpful um, to say the least. We wait for the Dobbs case in Mississippi. Uh, we could lose Roe, uh, but we know for sure where we believe there will be more and more restrictions. Uh, so there's a lot to do. Uh, in fact, I think this has been one of the most demanding years um, of the feminist movement late, uh, currently. Anyway, but we're fighting and we're not going to go back. And that's the important thing. And so we have two sides of this critical lens. And I turn it now back to Christian Yu. Thank you so much, Ellie. And, you know, everything you said is just hits, um, it's so poignant and so important because there are so many things that we have seen happen this year where it just seems like it's been like one big roller coaster, um, almost like we, we see success and we get a gain and then we hear about some horrible legislation or um, a law that's been passed and, and we're continuing to fight for these things that we have like def definitely seen that we've been fighting for over decades as you clearly um, identified. So tonight is why it's so important for us, right? Because we really wanna talk about the state of women from a feminist perspective. What are the highlights and what are the low lights and what do we need to continue to do to move forward? And we're super excited that the speakers um, that are part of this program tonight are really going to let us give way in on some key core issues for us, constitutional quality, economic justice and voting rights. Some of the main things that we have really seen resonate in all of our legislation, um, whether it be state or federal, um, we have seen this happen in our, we've been talking at our kitchen tables. These have been things that we definitely have seen constantly come up. So we're gonna take a look at all the legislative solutions that must continue to move us forward this year and, and especially forward on 2022 past midterms including, like Ellie said, removing the arbitrary deadline and the um, OLC memo, the Equal Rights Amendment, the Bill to Protect Voting Rights, uh, such as the John Rights Lewis Voting of Rights Advancement Act, which we know are freedom to vote, and also the Freedom to Vote Act that we know that um, was killed in the Senate, but we have to continue to push forward on those things. And the numerous economic justice and workplace fairness bills uh, that Ellie already mentioned as well along with the Pregnancy Discrimination Act and the Healthy Families Act, Social Security 2100, a Sacred Trust Act, and One Fair Wage Initiative, and much more. These are all so crucial and so important to helping us shape the, the future for feminists. Um, so it is more than my pleasure um, as we welcome our first round of speakers, and I turn it back over to Ellie to begin our uh, words and input and feedback from our amazing speakers and panelists. Yes, uh, it's, it's really great that we have some of the best speakers uh, and so appropriate. Uh, the first woman that we're going to hear from that has been fighting, fighting, fighting for us as chair of the um, Oversight and uh, Reform Committee, fighting for Afghan women, fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, just a champion of women's rights in many, many different ways, obviously for reproductive rights. So we're gonna hear from uh, Carolyn Maloney, who is the chair, uh, and that is like the third most powerful position in um, the house. And then we're gonna hear from Jackie Spear, oh, how we love her. She's been pushing, pushing, pushing for the Equal Rights Amendment for women in the military. She's on the Armed Services Committee, but we're going to miss her because she is leaving. She, this is her uh, last year. She's retiring, and I know she's not really retiring. She'll be there fighting for us. I'm anxious to see what she does next. And then finally, we're also going to hear from um, uh, uh, Jennifer Carol Foy, who ran for governor here in Virginia and who was the co-chair or the chair of the Drive for the Equal Rights Amendment along with Hala Ayala. So now we wanna thank each of these wonderful women and we wanna hear from them um, on, their, on their approach to what's happened in this last year. 
Thank you so much to the National Organization for Women for having me at your State of the Union. Reproductive rights are no longer being chipped away at. They are being bulldozed straight into the ground. In February of this year, the Senate failed to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, legislation that would have established a statutory right to abortion care nationwide. Unfortunately, this is just the latest attack on abortion rights. For example, it has been more than six months since Texas passed its ban on abortions after six weeks, and the results have been horrific. In fact, many pregnant women in Texas have been forced to wait so long for an appointment that they have been disqualified from receiving an abortion altogether. Unfortunately, these abortion bans are not limited to Texas. Six-week abortion bans have been introduced in at least 14 states. And of, as of February 18th, 39 state legislatures have filed more than 230 bills to ban or restrict access to abortion this year alone. This is all happening against the backdrop of a Supreme Court that has been increasingly hostile to women and to abortion rights. In December 2021, the court heard a case challenging Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban, which includes a ban for victims of rape and incest and signaled that it may very well overturn Roe v. Wade. Should that happen, millions of people across 26 states would immediately be de deprived of the right to ab abortion overnight. Women are not uh, full citizens, and there is no democracy if we can't even control our own health care and our own bodies. The time for action, for bold platform to fight back against conservative assault on reproductive rights is now. We must fight for reproductive justice by protecting and expanding access to abortion, birth control, and all forms of reproductive health care. This is how we're going to do it. First, we must cement the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. As we demonstrated in my House oversight hearing on the ERA in October, the first hearing on the ERA in 40 years, the ERA is already the 28th Amendment. Constitutional experts, including legal scholars from the ERA project at Columbia Law School, agree that the Trump memo blocking the ERA is erroneous. We have met the requirements for amending the Constitution and the National Archivist must certify it now. With Roe under attack, the ERA is more necessary than ever. The ERA will set a new baseline and establish equality as a constitutional right, thereby protecting access to reproductive health care. It will also keep us from losing additional rights, as Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor recently said. If we lose Roe, other fundamental rights are on the chopping block because, and I quote, none of those things are written into the Constitution, end quote. If we don't write equality into the Constitution, we could lose all those hard-won rights, uh, access to contraceptives, legal same-sex relationships, and marriage, in addition to abortion rights. But the Equal Rights Amendment would stop all that and enshrine equality into the law once and for all. Second, we must not give up on passing the Women's Health Protection Act. We can do this by making sure to elect pro-choice candidates to the House and the Senate. Third, Congress must pass the EACH Act, bold legislation that would reverse the Hyde Amendment and expand health coverage for abortion care. Fourth, we must continue to push back against medically unnecessary, stigmatizing restrictions on abortion pills, it, which is why I led more than 70 of my colleagues in introducing a resolution calling for equitable, science-based access to medication abortion care. And fifth, we must pass my Access to Birth Control Act, 
which I introduced last year with more than 100 of my colleagues. This bill targets birth control refusals by pharmacists, which create an unacceptable obstacles to people seeking contraception all over the country. Thank you again to NOW for consistently fighting to make reproductive justice a reality. And thank you for supporting women candidates. Let's not let another year and another Congress go by without securing these fundamental rights. Yes, I am a little, I, I, you can see why we all love uh, Representative Carolyn Maloney. She's out there on all the issues. She's held so many hearings to make them better. Uh, the next person that we're hearing from then is Jackie Spear, who's been fighting the battle for, as I said, the Equal Rights Amendment, taking away the time limit, uh, introduced a resolution uh, that 891 that uh, would recognize the ERA as having been, as being valid and, um, and a part of our constitution. We have met all the standards. Uh, so we have to make sure that that passes. And she's working very hard. And also her fight for justice and the ending of sexual harassment in the United States military. Uh, Jackie Spear, Congresswoman from California. Good evening. I'm thrilled to be at NOW's Feminist State of the Union. Thank you to all the sheroes for joining us tonight and for all the work you do on behalf of gender equality and the ERA. NOW has been an integral part of the fight for women's rights since its very founding, and you are more needed and more relevant than ever. The state of women is strong despite the challenges thrown at us, from the gender wage gap to the pink tax and the she session. Women continue to persevere and to thrive. That's not to say we don't have farther to go. Since our country's founding, women have been left out of the Constitution intentionally. We were deprived of basic rights to vote, enter most jobs, or own property. To this day, we are paid less for our work, violated with impunity, and discriminated against simply for being who we are. The ERA was first introduced in Congress in 1923. Yet a century later, the Constitution still does not guarantee gender equality. Now get this, of the 193 United Nation countries, 165 have an Equal Rights Amendment. Countries that have looked to us to model their own constitutions have recognized the equality of women and men. Yet, we have failed to do the same. Despite the tremendous progress women have made, we are still a deeply unequal society. In subtle and not so subtle ways, women are subject to discrimination a reality denied by many of my colleagues across the aisle who insist we don't need an ERA because women are already equal. To them, I ask, would you say that to Christy Roncala, who was raped by two football players of Virginia Tech? She sought justice under VAWA, but the Supreme Court struck down the federal civil remedy, claiming Congress lacked the power to pass it. Or how about Tracy Rex wrote, whose starting salary at the Arizona Department of Education was $17,000 lower than her male counterpart who started at the same time, and it was based on their previous salary history. A federal district court ruled that unequal starting salaries don't violate the Equal Pay Act because salary history is an acceptable business reason for unequal pay. Or Jessica Lenahan, whose estranged husband kidnapped and murdered their three young daughters after the police refused to enforce a restraining order. The Supreme Court ruled that Lenahan had no constitutionally protected right to enforcement of her restraining order. Or how about Peggy Young, 
who was put on unpaid leave without health insurance by the UPS when she got pregnant. The Supreme Court set such a stringent standard that in two-thirds of the cases after Young, courts ruled against pregnant workers seeking reasonable accommodations. If we had the ERA, these cases would have been different in their outcomes. The ERA will create stronger legal recourse against sex discrimination, empower Congress to better enforce and enact laws protecting women, and confirm the rightful place of gender equality in the Constitution, not subject to the whims of Congress or the White House. And despite the partisan rhetoric, I believe in my heart that most of my Republican colleagues know that this is not only recognition of our unalienable rights, it's the right thing to do. That's not to say the road ahead will be easy. The Department of Justice continues to argue in court against the archivist certifying the ERA. I believe the ERA has passed all constitutional hurdles, and the archivist can and must certify it now. I'm proud to champion my bill H.J. Res. 17, which you all have helped on, which passed the House last March with bipartisan support and would remove any shadow of a doubt that the arbitrary time limit on ratification is history. I've also in introduced H.Res. 891 with Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, which declared once and for all that the ERA is is our 28th Amendment. The House has done its job. Now it's time for the Senate to act. And we need you in this fight. From reaching out to your members of Congress to make sure they support this legislation, to speaking out about why we still need an ERA. It's only through our collective effort that we'll be able to achieve that eternal promise of equal justice under the law. Mark my words, we will get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, who has made such a difference in her service in, the, uh, in Congress for all of us. And now our last speaker in this whole uh, uh, section, uh, delegate, uh, former delegate, uh, Jennifer Carafoy, who was the champion, who was one of the key champions um, in the fight, the chief sponsor for the ratification of the ERA by the 38th state. So we salute Jennifer Carafoy and her look at... Hi, I'm Jennifer Carol Foy, and I'm a now member and an Equal Rights Amendment Coalition member. The words women nor sex are in the Constitution. When it says we the people, it's really saying we the men. We need laws written and interpreted in a sex neutral manner based on function rather than draconian stereotyped sex roles. Now there are a number of reasons why we need the Equal Rights Amendment. And that is why as a delegate here in Virginia, in January, 2020, it was my Equal Rights Amendment resolution that passed here in Virginia that I carried to make Virginia the 38th and final state needed to enshrine women's equality into the United States Constitution. It was no easy task. People said that it couldn't be done and that it was impossible. But I truly do believe that everything is impossible until it's done. And it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants who came before me fighting for women's equality ending sex-based discrimination, that we were able to get it done. Doing a bus tour throughout all of Virginia, going corner to corner, spreading the word across the Commonwealth that we don't have equality for women or ending sex discrimination in the United States Constitution, and it is desperately needed. And making the case 
to every Republican, Independent, and Democrat alike, that there may be some things that we disagree on, whether it's school funding, whether it is transportation, but one thing we will not be moved on is women's equality. And if we can't change your mind on enshrining the Equal Rights Amendment into the United States Constitution, then I promise you, we will change your seats. And it's that type of energy that helped us get the Equal Rights Amendment over the finish line here in Virginia. And it is that type of energy that will help make sure we get it done on the federal level as well. So we need the Equal Rights Amendment because while we have Pregnancy Discrimination Act, uh, which amended Title VII, there are gaps. For example, there are acts committed that are discriminatory in effect, such as refusing to offer accommodations to pregnant people, such as allowing a person who's pregnant to use a chair while working the register instead of having to stand nonstop for 10 hours, or being allowed to take more frequent bathroom breaks. When it is only women who are harmed by a policy, it is discriminatory and in violation of the fundamental principle of equal rights on the basis of sex. When we talk about equal pay, the Equal Rights Amendment could set the norm for equal pay and provide a basis for litigation and legislation to extend the same pay entitlements to women and men. Women on average are still paid 78 cents to the dollar that a man is paid. And it's even less if you are African-American, it's around 60 cents, and if you are Latina, is 50 cents and lower. And this is true despite laws on the books like the Equal Pay Act that guarantees equal pay for equal work. But the Equal Pay Act has a loophole that allows employers to say that there was a factor other than sex as a reason for disparate pay, making this law practically ineffective. If there is a loophole to have pay in equity, employers will use it. That's where the Equal Rights Amendment comes in and it would help close this loophole and enhance existing statutory protections against pay discrimination and bolster individual legal challenges to discriminatory conduct. In the realm of litigation, the Equal Rights Amendment will put women on equal footing in the legal system in all 50 states, particularly in areas where women have historically been treated as second-class citizens, including cases of public education, divorce, child custody, domestic violence, and sexual assault. Now, there were barriers that we faced since 2020. January 2020, to be specific, when we passed the Equal Rights Amendment in Virginia. And one of those barriers have been the fact that the Trump administration had the Office of Legal Counsel issue an opinion saying that the Equal Rights Amendment should not be treated as valid. Virginia and Nevada's passage should not be uh, recorded, including Illinois. And because the archivist must certify the, the passing of the Equal Rights Amendment by the last three states, we have to have that certification in order to have true ratification. And so what we need to happen now going forward, now that we have a democratic president who believes in the Equal Rights Amendment and a vice president who does as well, we need the Office of Legal Counsel under direction of the Attorney General to withdraw this Trump issued and mandated 
false uh, Office of Legal Counsel opinion that stands in the way of us actually getting certification by the archivist of the requisite states to pass the Equal Rights Amendment and finally have it enshrined into the United States Constitution. So we are going forward. We have filed multiple suits. We have great legislators in the federal government who are putting in bills to make it that the timeline that was placed on the Equal Rights Amendment in the preamble, which is not actually part of the substantive uh, amendment, to actually have that timeline dissolved, made moot, so that it's not applicable because it truly isn't. And that way that will free up a lot of the legal entanglements and uh, lawsuits that have been filed because every other argument against the Equal Rights Amendment, we feel confident that it has been addressed. And we wanna make clear that there is no timeline, there is no deadline on equality. And so we are constantly putting pressure to ensure that the people who say that they support the Equal Rights Amendment don't just say it in word, but support it in deed. And that means allowing the archivist to finally record the last three states so we can have true enshrinement and ratification. Now you may be asking, well, what can I do? Ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment would affirm that sex discrimination is inconsistent with the nation's core values of equal protection under the law. And it would send a clear message about a national commitment to inherent equality of all people. And that's why what we do next means everything. The things that we can do to ensure that our nation's core value of equal protection under the law is heard loud and clear is to contact our federal legislators to make sure they know that we are going nowhere. We're not backing down. And we will be heard from today that we want their unwavering, committed support for the Equal Rights Amendment. We want to be sure that we contact the White House and we thank our president and vice president and his administration for supporting the Equal Rights Amendment. But again, we need it done, not just in word or in spirit, but in deed. And let's get this done. Let's continue to support the amazing organizations that make the Equal Rights Amendment a top agenda issue. And I wanna thank all of you for being supportive of the National Organization for Women because they work so hard to make sure that this issue is brought to the forefront. They are on the, the front lines. They are right there at the rallies and we need them. So your continued support for now goes very, very far. Now this amendment does so much and adding the Equal Rights Amendment to the constitution would give equality between sexes the highest legal protection in law, thereby filling in any gaps open by individual laws. I always say that when people come to me and tell me that, hey, Jen, we have these, these, these laws, we have these policies, well, laws can change as quickly as legislators change their minds. And women's equality shouldn't be dependent upon who wins or loses an election. So if we want true equality, then we need to be where we belong. And that is enshrined in our founding document. We must have the strength and the conviction to not give up or to give in. Sex discrimination ends with our generation. We are here to agitate for equality, to disrupt the status quo, to fight fearlessly for change. Let me be clear, 160 million women and girls across this country are waiting with a bated breath for their constitutional equality. It's really clear 
Equality is for everyone and everyone should be for equality. I want to thank now. Thank you for being the largest feminist grassroots organization in the nation. And on the cutting edge of the issues that are intersectional and important to all of us and advocating and dedicating yourself to all of the issues that will uplift some of the most marginalized people, which are women. And I wanna thank you. Thank the president, Christian Nunes for your amazing leadership. Thank you all for your time. I am Jennifer Carol Foy, and let's remember that we will be heard from today and remind everyone there's only one way to spell equality, and that is E-R-A. Thank you all so much. <laughs>
we need to prioritize local races and state races because election boards that make decisions are at the state and local level. Redistricting and this insane gerrymandering takes place at the state level. We need women to run for local and state legislatures and women to serve on local election boards. How can we fight back? By not just defending Jada Pinkett Smith from Chris Rock, but defending Ketanji Brown Jackson from the GOP senators who disrespected and harassed her more than any other Supreme Court nominee in this nation's history. We must demand this first black woman be seated on the Supreme Court as a balance to that scale, that scale, that Supreme Court that upheld Republican Alabama's racist redistricting while striking down Democratic Wisconsin's equitable redistricting. How can we fight back? By remembering our history. Though the Voting Rights Act has been all but eliminated, we never would have had a Voting Rights Act if not for women. It was Amelia Boynton Robinson, Marie Foster, Annie Lee Cooper, Diane Nash. In Selma, these women organized and suffered for the Voting Rights Act to be passed, for us to have our right to vote. Let these sheroes serve as an inspiration to us all. And they won't be the only ones. As your president of now, the wonderful Christian Nunez, and your political director, Kiana Dickinson, joined us in Selma this very month, I'd like to offer you some inspiration from another woman who was just a little girl on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday. Joanne Bland and I spoke during this year's Bridge Crossing Jubilee. And what you're about to see is being seen for the first time. Yeah, yeah. I was on the bridge on Bloody Sunday. Yeah, I know. I'm, yeah, I'm, and you actually, you were injured, right? Yeah, I fainted, actually. I was terrified. Yeah. Um, and and to, how, how old were you? I was 11 years old. Wow. 11. Yeah. So what happened after you fainted? Well, I don't remember anything after that. I remember what led up to it. Um, but I really don't know exactly what happened. I saw a horse in this lady, right? They were running the horses right into the crowd, trampling people, right? And I don't know, did the horse just run over her or did he hit her and she fell? But all these years later, 57 years later, I could still hear the sound her head made when it hit that pavement. That's the last thing I remember until I was on the city side of the bridge in the back of a car and my head was in my sister Linda's lap. You know, and I, Linda was bleeding, uh, but I thought it was her tears at first dropping on my face, and I wiped it, and I saw it was blood dropping. She had wounds in her head that required 35 stitches. I just had a huge lump on the back of my head. That was it. Um, and I doubt if I had a concussion because I didn't have any repercussions after that. Any repercussions. Now, in the family, was it just you and your sister out there? No, no. I had another two sisters out there. Okay. And you all were young. I mean, what made you at 11 years old decide? Well, actually, thing? you know, I was arrested the first time when I was eight, along with my grandmother, who was the emphasis for us being there. Grandma was a uh, head grazer, so she, she uh, had lived in Detroit and had shared some freedoms that we didn't have in the segregated South. So she said, oh, no, we need to do something about this. And so she would go to meetings, and, of course, she would take us. Now, don't make me lie and say I understood how the right to vote would translate to what um, me getting the things that I felt like I wanted, right? I didn't understand that until much later. But I do know that Grandma told me I could sit at this segregated lunch counter if I got when we got our freedom. So I became a freedom fighter then. At, at a young age. If Joanne and her sister, as children, could help win our right to vote, then we know what we must do now as adults to win it back. And for those who have given up and become apathetic and say they have nothing to vote for, remind them we're barely two years removed from Donald Trump. While the enemies of Roe 
have been fighting for 50 years. And because those enemies haven't given up, those enemies of Roe, Roe is now on the ropes. They've been fighting for 50 years. We can't give up ourselves after only two years, can we? Dr. Osajefo Kwame Nkrumah, the president of Ghana, said, you can measure the degree of a country's revolutionary awareness by the political maturity of its women. National Organization for Women, let's be the vanguard again. God bless you all. Wow, that is so powerful. Uh, just hearing from Joanne Bland, one of the foot soldiers, and I will tell you, um, being in Selma uh, and just talking with so many of the foot soldiers who were women, and a lot of times the unsung heroes that we don't hear, who were there defending our voting rights and the importance, and also just hearing stories about how in 1965, many of these individuals said that they had more voting rights than they do in 2022. And this is why it's even so much more important that we continue this fight and we continue to move forward in the work we're doing on the grassroots level and in our communities and in our states and, on, and all the way to the federal level. So thank you so much, Reverend Thompson, for your tremendous insight, your encouragement, um, and your motivation for us as we continue to work toward fighting voter restrictions in our communities. Our next voting rights speaker is um, a great friend of mine and CEO of League of Women Voters US, Virginia K. Solomon, who is another amazing activist and advocate who has spent over 25 years of her career fighting social justice and civil rights. And as a CEO of League of Women Voters, she builds upon her vision of an inclusive democracy where every person in America has the ability and opportunity to participate and advocate for issues that matter most to them. Now that is where we talk about issues that matter most to us, right? So let us welcome Virginia. We are excited for her to join us and let us know that the League of Women Voters what works to promote pro-voter reforms that both preserve existing rights and provide flexibility for casting ballots in order to be inclusive in histor historically underserved communities. And, and they, she will talk with us, explain to us why it's important and what are some of the barriers we face at the ballot box as we move forward and how they have a desperate impact on women. Let's welcome Virginia Case Solomon. Hello, my name is Virginia K. Solomon, CEO of the League of Women Voters of the United States where we empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. With voting rights gridlocked in Congress and without a national standard in place, our right to vote is under attack. Already, several states have enacted laws that would restrict voting rights, especially for those in underrepresented communities. These egregious laws occur when politicians put power and special interests ahead of what's truly important, us, the voters. You see, voting brings us together as Americans, and the Voting Rights Act was created to ensure that every American has the freedom to vote. But recently, voters have faced a variety of obstacles just have their voices heard at the ballot box. We've seen reduced polling locations that lead to long lines, unfair voter identification requirements, illegal removal of registered voters from the rolls, and restrictions that limit voters' options for casting their ballot. Gerrymandering and unfair maps have and continue to purposefully dilute the voices of Black and Brown communities. And not only that, but we've seen new threats on how elections are run and elections and officials and poll workers face violent threats. This is not a democracy that is reflective of the people that it serves because our democracy is not based on age, race, gender, or zip code. 
It's supposed to be for everyone. And that is why we must protect the right to vote at all costs. Voting is a fundamental principle and all Americans deserve the equal opportunity to make their voices heard. We must not allow voter suppression to pervade our democracy. We must stand up for voting rights now and continue to push our leaders in Congress to make voting rights a priority for the American people. And that means restoring the Voting Rights Act, which will strengthen our elections by eliminating obstructive laws that keep voters of color from exercising their rights at the ballot box. And it also means passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. We cannot back down until every voter can safely participate in free and fair elections. And we will continue this fight until all voters, especially black, brown, and indigenous people have their voices heard fully. The bottom line is this, our democracy depends on the participation of all people. And when our elections are fair and free, our democracy, it prevails. And I believe we will win. It's, we want to end on economic justice. So much of what we're fighting for is that everybody gets a better break. And um, as you know, the Build Back Better Bill did not pass. And a lot of it is just critical for economic justice. It, it uh, deals with child care, it deals with elder care, it deals with the caring community, and, and uh, so much of, of the work of women, especially low-income women. Um, and no one has fought harder for this whole uh, area of economic justice. Uh, and frankly, she fights hard for so many crucial, crucial issues than Congresswoman Barbara Lee. They often call her the conscience of the House. Uh, she deserves that. Uh, she has fought against war and for um, nonviolence. She has fought, uh, she's there, believe me. I can't tell you how many issues I have worked with her on. Uh, I'm proud to introduce her. And um, I know that she will have a strong message for the uh, child tax credit, which brought one, ha one half of, uh, of all children living before the poverty line up, but it has uh, not been extended. It should be a part there permanently rather than just during the ep epidemic. And she's fought hard for uh, Medicaid justice for, uh, for a poor woman uh, that it would cover abortion uh, with the each act. She's just there for the for poor women and for just economic justice. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Barbara Lee and I'm proud to represent the beautiful 13th Congressional District of California. Thank you to the National Organization for Women for having me today and thank you to now President Christian Nunez and Feminist Majority President Ellie Smeal. To all of the activists, organizers, and feminists here in the audience, thank you so much for leading the fight for gender equity. For decades, women have been at the forefront of civil rights movements fiercely fighting to ensure equal justice under the law. Because of women like my mentor, Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman elected to Congress, she paved the way for many of us. We have women like Vice President Kamala Harris. Because of women like Constance Baker Motley this year, we will celebrate the historic nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to serve on the Supreme Court, the first black woman ever nominated. However, throughout history, the achievements of too many extraordinary women have gone unappreciated and overlooked. The American economy has relied on generations and generations of underpaid labor, especially domestic labor and care work by women. This dynamic has only been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, 
women earned just 82 cents for every dollar a man made. Closing the pay gap is also more than just a women's issue. It's also an issue of racial and economic justice. Women of color constitute a huge portion of the care economy, and yet black and indigenous women and Latinx, Latinas earn less than 64 cents to every dollar paid to a white man, and Latinas are paid at an average of 55 cents to every dollar. Shameful. Through robust legislation and a new social infrastructure, we can build a system that not only lowers the skyrocketing cost of care, but ensures women are getting paid fairly and equitably. As President Biden underscored during the recent State of the Union address, we must fight for policies that target these inequities impacting women. However, this can't happen without the support of activists across the country at all levels of government. We all must continue mobilizing and making our voices heard. This year, Feminist State of the Union is an important opportunity to not just discuss the policies that we need to fight for, but to reflect on how far we've come and use that motivation for the future. I thank you all for your hard work and look forward to continuing the fight for gender equity and parity. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Barbara Lee, for every everything you've done for so many people for so long. Uh, our next speaker on this subject, and I think it's the last of the evening, I'm not quite sure of that, might be off schedule here, is uh, represent, is the new CEO of the American Association University Women, which has all through this period, but a great ally of now and of a, uh, a feminist majority, but of so many groups. You know, they always want to say that the women's groups are fighting. We actually aren't. We've got so much work to do. We don't have that time for that. And besides, we've been standing shoulder to shoulder to make real change. So we welcome the new CEO uh, of the AUW. I'm saying new, but rather rather new. Gloria Blackwell, who, uh, and, uh, and we honor AUW for all of its fights for economic and educational ju justice. I'm Gloria Blackwell, Chief Executive Officer at the American Association of University Women, AAUW. Every one of the measures that President Biden addressed in his State of the Union remarks are essential to bringing about economic justice and parity for women. Let's start with child care. The American workplace is based on an outdated model of family, and that has made it very hard for women to achieve economic security. For the most part, family caretaking responsibilities still fall disproportionately on women's shoulders, so we need to have policies and workplace practices that support them in that regard. All workers need paid sick leave and paid parental and caregiving leave. All families need access to safe and affordable child care. The temporary return of the child tax credit as an emergency COVID-19 provision moved us in the right direction. It was a lifesaver for working families, extended to the families of 23 million children who were previously ineligible because their parents made too little. Making it permanent without including harmful work requirements will facilitate economic stability, assisting with families' basic needs like housing, groceries, and care while reducing the child poverty rate by an estimated 45%. In terms of the minimum wage, without a doubt, this is a women's issue. Women comprise two thirds of the low wage workforce, so they are especially burdened by a minimum wage that doesn't come close to covering the basic costs of living. The $7.25 federal minimum wage has not increased in more than a decade. And the $2.13 tip minimum wage has been frozen for nearly 30. AAUW supports the Raise the Wage Act, which would gradually increase the federal minimum wage to $15 per hour by 2025. 
then index the minimum wage so that it continues to rise along with wages overall. We also need to move the needle on the wage gap, something that hasn't happened in far too long. The Paycheck Fairness Act will close loopholes that have weakened the law over time to allow employers to justify paying workers unfair wages, create more robust remedies for those who have suffered discrimination, and ban the use of salary history to set wages. The gender pay gap is persistent and can only be addressed if women have the tools they need to challenge discrimination and employers have the tool have the incentive they need to comply with the law. In short, we need our elected leaders and our business leaders to step up and help women out. There are many ways activists can get involved, some of which take very little time and effort. First off, educate yourself. Find out what's going on in your community, your state, in the nation. Pick a few issues you feel passionate about and follow them closely so you're aware of what's happening. If there are issues you're concerned about, contact your state legislators and your members of Congress to let them know. For example, you support proposals to make child care more affordable or that you think we need stronger equal pay laws. Your vote is your voice. Take a hard look at candidates for office and their public stances on issues impacting women and gender equity. You can write op-eds or letters to the editor to support issues you believe in. A very easy way to support the Paycheck Fairness Act is to use the two-minute activist tool at aauw.org to urge your members of Congress to take action. It's very hard for women to succeed in a workplace where they don't feel welcomed or safe. Women of color in the workforce force face the double whammy of gender and racial discrimination, which holds them back and impacts their earning potential. Black women still earn only about 58 cents for every dollar paid to a white man. For all women, sexual harassment creates an uncomfortable work environment for women and forces many women out of certain fields, especially high paying ones like the STEM fields, which are still very male dominated. Lawmakers must do their part, but employers also need to work harder to create workplaces that are free from bias, discrimination, and sexual harassment. This won't just happen, it takes intentionality. We need to stop paying lip service to gender equity and really be proactive in making it happen and changing the system. It's long overdue, and the recent pandemic and economic hardships have really set us back. We must do what we can to end discrimination, reduce the pay gap between men and women, and strengthen federal, state, and local policy to help women succeed and thrive in the workplace. All women deserve better. Thank you so much to all of our speakers on economic justice. Now, I don't want anyone to go anywhere. We have one more group of dynamic speakers from our young feminists that are gonna give their take on how all these issues relate to young feminists and young women. So I wanna get right to it. So just hold with us because we always wanna give you a little bit of taste of the young feminist perspective and close out with a nice call to action. So first I'd like to welcome Joy Dean and Sri Marotra who are our co-chairs for NOW's Young Feminist National Committee. The question that we have for Joy as a co-chair of Young Feminist Committee, um, she's earned her marketing degree from Florida Atlantic University and has a passion for activism and leadership. And she founded actually the executive board for the FAU Now chapter or Campus Action Network chapter. So we're thrilled to have her. Joy, a young feminist today are facing so many problems in their future. They're having to look at a reproductive justice from a lens that they never have had before. So even if um, we look at possibly the overturning of Roe 
And even for stands, more and more states are drastically limiting their access to reductive health care. So we know this is a serious issue that we have to continue to advocate for. And if you just realize, we just put out a statement yesterday about the secret vote that Puerto Rico Senate took to not have a public hearing or feedback for an abortion ban bill. So we see the extreme measures and the, the, the deceptive measures these lawmakers are taking, legislators are taking to in order to try to restrict uh, women's autonomy and their reproductive rights. So we're gonna turn it over to Joy to give us a little take on how do we protect reproductive rights in this era. Hi everyone, my name is Joy Dean. I am one of the co-chairs of NOW's Young Feminist National Committee and also the previous president of the Florida Atlantic University chapter of NOW. So the Young Feminist National Committee is looking to activate and support grassroots actions to protect reproductive rights nationwide. We want to see continued collaboration between NOW, Feminist Majority Foundation, and other progressive organizations. While we continue to fight towards a common goal, it is more imperative now than ever to work collaboratively and play on each other's strengths to come up with creative solutions to advocate for reproductive rights. One way organizations can work together to protect reproductive rights is to amplify the voices of young feminists. Our CANS, or Campus Action Networks, consist of a network of over 700 young feminists at 40 campuses nationwide. We have student leaders at high schools and colleges across the country ready to activate and continue now to historic fight for reproductive freedom. These CANS are ushering in the next generation of activists while creating inclusive, welcoming spaces on their campus. Over the past few months, our CANs have held on-campus demonstrations, hosted letter writing parties, traveled to their state's capital, and met with elected officials to emphasize the importance of reproductive rights for all. Another way organizations can support this effort is to take an intersectional approach to this issue. Reproductive rights are not just a women's issue, but something that ends up affecting all people. While advocating for reproductive rights, we look to use inclusive language, such as pregnant people or people with uteruses instead of pregnant women. We continue to fight for reproductive rights of all people, Black women, members of the LGBTQIA community, Indigenous people, the disabled community, the unhoused community, etc. So I ask you all, as we continue to fight for reproductive rights, ask yourself, is my work intersectional? Does it include the voices of marginalized community? Am I doing the work to create a welcoming environment for people of color? Am I uplifting people of color? Am I making space to them without putting the burden of inclusion on them? Is my organization taking into account the experiences of trans women? Are all marginalized communities being represented? Am I being intersectional? Well, thank you so much, Joy. We really appreciate your feedback and your questions for our participants and membership. And it's so important because part of our mission it now is to do our grassroots activism through an intersectional approach and racial justice lens. So the questions Joy laid out for us and how we can move forward um, for reproductive rights and now or if it's post row is so important to be inclusive um, and from an intersectional perspective. So on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to our next co-chair, Sri Marotra. And Sheree will talk to us. Sheree is a co-chair of the Anthems Committee. She's also a young activist from New Jersey who works for the Justice Department Civil Rights Division there. And in her role at the DOJ, she works with the voting section to monitor elections and with the disability rights section to uphold American Disabilities Act. So Joy firsthand, I mean, Sheree firsthand can tell you what she's seeing and what's going on. Um, she also serves on now New Jersey and their PAC Secretary and Advocacy Coordinator. We are thrilled to welcome Sri. She will give us a look at how this all looks, what we talked about tonight from the Young Feminist perspective. Sri. Hi, I'm Sri Marocha and I'm co-chair of NOW's Young Feminist National Committee. I'm really excited to be here at the Feminist State of the Union discussing all these issues. I think young people care about a lot of this, but especially economic justice. Um, as young feminists are graduating school and entering the workforce, they're thinking about a lot of these issues, including pay equity, the $15 minimum wage, um, racial wealth gap, health care, and housing. And I think this ends up affecting the colleges that they select in terms of basing it off of how much student debt they're going to get into, what they major in, and then eventually which industries they choose to enter. And so I think a lot of young people are thinking a lot about these issues and are interested in getting involved. They just need a little bit more 
awareness about how to get involved so this requires more collaboration and communication because I think people across the gen generations can really learn from one another whether that be different kinds of advocacy that's been effective um, and how activism is also changing with social media. So I think a lot of chapters and organizations are already collaborating with existing young feminist groups, so we can do more of that. Like there's great groups like Generation Ratify and Period that are doing amazing work. So I think young people are already mobilized around a lot of social justice issues. It's more that we need to harness this advocacy for feminist issues or really just show them how their issues are already feminist issues since, you know, minimum wage, housing, healthcare, these are all feminist issues as they impact women first and foremost. So that's why I'm really excited that we're having this event to give a feminist lens to a lot of these political issues that impact women primarily. Well, we want to give a wrap up, but it's, uh, it's hard. We're almost over time. Uh, this is going to be a pivotal year. And the one thing that we didn't talk very much about because we had this and the basis, what issues are at stake is this election that's coming up in 2022. We must keep the house. We've got to make the margin bigger, not lose it. If we lose it, it's catastrophic. But we get, and we can't take anything for granted. We're going to need as much activity to get out the vote as possible. And it's the same for the Senate. It's even more. If we're going to pass the Voting Rights Act, if we're going to uh, take out the time limit on, on on the ERA, even though it's not necessary, because as um, the speakers have all said, it has already passed. Uh, we want to make sure everybody knows that. And by the way, the big, the most famous constitutional scholars have all said it's valid and it's passed and it should be published and certified by the archivist. But we have to fight to make that happen. It would help a lot if we could get rid of the filibuster in the Senate. The only way we could do that is increase the margin for the Democrats in the Senate. Um, and so I think this election is crucially important for the House and the Senate and for uh, the elections uh, uh, coming up. We cannot lose our democracy. We must get rid of the stalemate in, in Congress. There's so many issues at stake. Uh, we've mentioned so just a few of them. But if we're ever going to pass the child care, uh, elder care, paid elder care, paid child care, family medical leave, et cetera, we got to get a bigger margin. And, and now knows how to do that. We can argue, uh, we can organize and organize. You could, the feminist majority, as you know, will be a partner in, with now, but uh, it's so key what everybody does. I hope that we all decide, I don't know where it's coming from because so many of the people on this um, call, uh, Zoom, are people already have given up time, but if we can only get more volunteers, more time, get out the vote, and move forward because these issues, many of them that we discussed today could be solved very easily with the right combination in the House and the Senate. Um, so let's go. It's a challenging year, but we've always been, have met the challenge and then some were so close to the Equal Rights Amendment, we are going to get it in that, enshrined in the constitution. Yes, okay. Ellie. And thank you very much, Christian, for the night. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we have, LA just really closed it up well for us. And I know, thank you all for hanging with us. Um, I just want to just once again, thank our the Feminist Majority Foundation, NOW, National Action Committee, our grassroots members, um, our participants and advocates, and those who are not members or parts of organizations. So we drop your our address in the chat, please. Join us as this fight is really clearly laid out. It's so needed, and we need all everyone involved to really help us um, save our democracy as we move forward. So thank you all again, um, and we wish you all a great evening, and we will keep moving forward for our feminist agenda. And thank you for attending the Feminist State of the Union. Have a great evening. Thank you.